Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Demon Bone Sarcophagus. This is the latest adventure by Patrick Stewart and Scrap Princess, and it is a direct sequel to Deep Carbon Observatory, which is their previous adventure, probably their best known adventure, which I have reviewed previously on this channel. Unlike Deep Carbon Observatory, Demon Bone Sarcophagus is a strict dungeon crawl. There's a little bit of exploration outside the tomb, but the assumption is that you will jump right in and explore this fairly large complex of about 60 rooms, a little more than 60 rooms, over the course of probably many sessions. I really like this cover. I think it's one of Scrap Princess's best covers. Just the way that the image works and the colors and the shapes and the font, everything just comes together to make a really great iconic image. Now, the general structure of the tomb looks like this. It's essentially a giant triangle made up of smaller triangles that are all connected together. So there's lots of exploration that can be done here. You can go in virtually any direction in this tomb and come at rooms from all sorts of different angles. On top of that, there's a number of secondary passages that you can use. There's a whole system of tunnels underneath the tomb. These are big sloth tunnels that you can use to navigate and skip around to parts of the dungeon, possibly bypassing extra dangerous areas. And there's a series of temporal or spatial rifts that have been ripped in the fabric of time and space that link some of these rooms together in a different pattern. This is caused by an invading demon. So using both of these systems, you have all sorts of different options for exploration. The inside front covers shows what it looks like right above the tomb. So essentially you have this giant statue right there and you can see the outline of the tomb um, sort of overlaid on this. You can see where all the rooms are relative to this overworld structure. And you as a group of PCs come across this massacre or a fight. Some calamity has happened here. A whole bunch of people are dead. Only a few people are left alive and a bunch of holes have opened up into this labyrinth down below. And you can explore down there and chase after the, the NPCs that have escaped and try and get treasure and all that stuff. The next two pages are a really great summary, although you really should read the whole book before you, this will make a whole lot of sense, where we have the major factions right here. There's six different factions that met in the overworld that had this giant fight, and some of the remnants of those factions are now wandering in the tombs below, so you need to know how all of those work. We have all the tomb rooms here that are broken down into different uh, sections. This is the table of contents, but you can also see how the different rooms are grouped because they often have thematic groups. Now, before we go any further, I have to point out probably the biggest issue with the book, and that is that there is a lot of spelling, grammatical, and typographical errors throughout the book. There's often one or more on each page. So it's definitely a book that could have used a lot more proofreading or editing in order to get into a fully polished shape. Uh, the worst example of this is there is a section where an entire paragraph is missing. Uh, that would be right over here. This whole section is kind of missing. And this page was inserted into my review copy to show what should have been there. Hopefully this is in the rest of the copies that people are getting as well. There are other examples of the encounter tables being in the wrong space on a page. Sometimes there are paragraphs that are duplicated. Overall, it is kind of irritating when you run into those things. However, for the most part, it doesn't actually impede you from reading it and understanding what's going on. Uh, this one particular page is the only major issue for that. And it mostly covers the background of what happened before the adventure starts. Now, all that being said, and my complaints being duly noted, uh, this was one of the most entertaining books to read that I have read in a very long time. Uh, Patrick Stewart is one of my favorite writers in the OSR, and even though a lot of his books have like these errors and spelling mistakes and things like that throughout them that I wish were fixed, I do enjoy reading them so much. They are absolutely packed with inspiration. They are full of amazing ideas that I would never have thought of. I laughed multiple times while reading it, and that rarely happens while I am uh, reading a role-playing game book. Before we get any deeper into the book, though, a quick shout-out to today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Speak False Machine, a massive compendium of Patrick Stewart's writings on his False Machine blog, now available on Kickstarter. False Machine is one of the most influential blogs in the OSR blogosphere and was instrumental in getting me interested in old-school gaming. The book covers 10 years of his creative output, from RPG theory to world building to short fiction and book reviews. Everything has been organized by topic for ease of reference and will feature a number of illustrations from legends like Jason Thompson, Jez Gordon, and Peter Mullen. The campaign ends on December 1st, so back it on Kickstarter while you can using the link in the description. One thing I actually rather enjoyed is that rather having the very deep backstory of this particular dungeon, you know, why it's there, who all these people are, and so on, 
in the actual room descriptions, which can bloat them to ridiculous sizes and aren't relevant to the dungeon master, all of that backstory has been packed into the front of the book. So you can read it or not read it. I think it is helpful to read it. I enjoyed reading it. It's it's fun and an, it's an interesting story and shows some really fantastic world building. And you get a real sense for what's going on uh, in that dungeon. It, it's hard to summarize, but basically there is a plane of fire with some fire nobility that are always in conflict with one another. And two of them fell in love with a mortal woman and they formed this kind of three-way marriage because that's the way that the fire people work. In time, they have a child with her and her child should be accepted as a fire people nobility, but that was not to happen. And there's a whole tragic backstory. Everything goes to hell. Eventually she dies and is buried in this tomb with a lot of, there's links in it and references in it to the plane of fire. So fire and this tomb are intricately linked in all sorts of ways. And that comes out thematically. The woman becomes the first mortal queen of fire, at least on our mortal plane, and has all sorts of horrible enemies, mostly involving acid barons and demons from the ice hells. And after she dies, her followers bury her in this giant tomb, which also works as a kind of prison to imprison most of her most dangerous enemies to prevent them from escaping either into the mortal world or even to fully die and be sent back to hell where they could reincarnate or cause more problems. They're kind of trapped in this limbo inside this tomb along with all sorts of other guardians meant to keep anyone from leaving. And if you enter into the tomb, those guardians are going to try and stop you from leaving as well. There's a lot of details here that I'm just skipping over, but hopefully you get the general idea. Um, I really love these, uh, I'm not sure what to call them, these little edge pieces here that show you where you are in the book. So you can see what came before, what came after. I've seen this kind of design used in um, the most recent version of Pathfinder. And it's kind of nice to see this here too, because you really can see um, how far you are away from different sections of the book and what's coming up. So what are you going to be doing in this adventure? You're going to be entering the tomb, discovering its secrets, meeting the conspirators, or the leaders of all these factions that are that are running around inside the tomb now, encounter the guardians there, find the fire queen sarcophagus, possibly it's the most difficult place to find, and unravel the threat of the ice demons. There are very powerful demons imprisoned in here, and you want to make sure they stay there. Although when you first venture into it, you're not really going to know that they are there at all. So they could trick you and find a way to escape, and that could have long-term consequences for your campaign. This book is the first book in a planned trilogy called Broken Fire Regime. The second book being Frictionless Blue Glass, named after a powerful faction in this world, and Palaces of Fire being a projected third book. We have a way for generating backgrounds for your characters right here. You start over here on this side, and you work your way this way, jumping around from through each of these little blobs to compose your backstory. And as each player does this, occasionally they're going to both choose the same blob, or I don't know what to call it, a little paragraph. And that's going to represent something that you had in common. So for example, if you both started here, you and another player, and then you both moved to here, then you were both in a Kraken gang at some point. So hopefully this creates a network of relationships. The fiasco, the bloody attack that you stumble across at the beginning of the adventure is caused by two separate conspiracies running into one another. These involve basically six different factions, although two of them are related to the Frictionless Blue Glass Company, which is a powerful faction in the area. And each one involves a person traveling somewhere. In one case, it's a person tra with a caravan traveling with weapons and goods for a rebellion against the Blue Glass Company. And another one is a woman who has infiltrated the company and has all sorts of notes on how to do a heist there. And she has all of these uh, information and she's traveling to give it to someone else who really wants that information so that they can you know, rob the company. And each of these different groups is being followed by another group who's often being followed by another group. And they collide with each other and there's a series of misunderstandings and before long, everyone is dead, much like in a Tarantino movie. And there's a map here that breaks down the battle into a couple different areas and goes through in detail what you're gonna find there if you stop to investigate all the bodies. There's a lot of bodies and a lot of stuff has happened. So you're probably gonna have players who want to get on with the adventure. And if that's the case, there's a number of holes in the ground that have opened up. One of these is caused by a giant sloth which burst out of the earth and caused a lot of this commotion. And several of the other holes are caused by these acid girls, these sort of mechanical glass golems that are filled with incredibly powerful acid. And they were smashed and they have burned holes into the earth directly down into the tomb below, giving you a number of possible entry points. Each of the living NBCs is described in these little stat blocks here, but it doesn't really have stats. It's just describing them in a way that makes it easier for you to run. So I really like how it has common things that they will say if you ask about different things that you have noticed on this battlefield. So you immediately know what they know. It's a huge big murder scene, which you can investigate and piece together the story if you really want to. But let's skip ahead to actually getting into the dungeon. I like how these maps kind of summarize everything. I like how the numbers are bigger here, so that's easier to read. 
and each of these four room chunks has a different color with a little note so that you get a general sense of what each of the zones is like. That's gonna help you put together the bigger picture of what's going on in the dungeon really quickly. There's a rundown of what the tomb is like in general, where there's an unnatural darkness that's kind of pressing in against you due to a magic item in the dungeon that you can recover if you wanna remove that unnatural darkness, which also prevents scrying ahead. There are wall murals on the three walls of every single room, and those are kind of key to figuring out uh, these combination locks that are on some doors. These combination locks are not terribly difficult. It's a pretty simple little riddle to solve one. And once you've solved it, you've solved them all. The idea being is that it's a way to slow down the player characters so that if they are in a dangerous situation and they need to flee a room quickly, sometimes they won't be able to if there's one of those locks in place just because it'll take, you know, 10 seconds to solve it. Scattered throughout the whole tomb, there are six tomb keys. You can see where they can be found right here. They're normally quite light when they're owned by their owner, but if they're stolen by a thief, then they immediately become incredibly heavy, about 160 pounds. So virtually impossible to carry around unless you think of a clever way to do that. That's gonna force you to use a lot more diplomacy to get people to actually give you these keys rather than just using violence. So the encounter section has the NPCs and the monsters you're gonna be running into, and they all have incredibly vivid uh, descriptions along with really great art by Scrap Princess. The art for these is a lot uh, cleaner and a lot more readable than some of uh, Scrap's previous stuff in books like uh, Veins of the Earth or Fire on the Velvet Horizon, and I quite like the style. Patrick's descriptions are also great as usual. For example, this is Anna Rocket Bon Vive. They all have really crazy names. Closer look, middle-aged, sweating, stained by dust and dirt. Clothes of a high-status bourgeoisie. Translucent blue spatter mark down one side of her face. Clutches a document cased to her chest. Uh, background. Rarely in life has any human being been more aware that they are as effed as Anna Racket Bon Vive is right now. Amoral, compromised, and endlessly overlooked, Bon Vive writhes with the cancerous wrath of a coward who realizes they have sold their soul for nothing. That is a great description. It really anchors the character in your head, and you are going to know how to run them. We have backup baboons because baboons are a hilarious monster to have running around inside a tomb. We have Boreala, who's sort of a kind of a wind elemental made of leaves. The broken heart, who's like this cat hybrid, kind of like a sphinx, dancing automata. We have demons with really great names like Triple Point Star of Fear Inaccessible. There are demon possessed baboons, demon worshippers, Drizula Machete, who's one of the NPCs, one of the leaders of the factions, now running around in the tomb. Flamethrower Skeletons, that's very Doom, I love that. Obsidian Assassins, who can transform into the shape of a mirror, steal your reflection, and then transform into a reflection of you in order to lure other people to their doom. Protection Men, who are these hooded assassins that have had their faces removed to do uh, temp work for the Frictionless Blue Glass Company. The Pyroclastic Guardian, who's a giant cloud of boiling smoke that will gobble you up and slowly dissolve you inside its belly. The Reductor, a fantastic monster that has all of these hooks and it has to climb around on the ceiling. If it ever touches the floor, it will be dragged down to hell, which gives it a really great weakness that, that you can try and exploit once you figure out that that is its weakness. A second sloth. You always want giant sloths in your D&D games. Tiny knights to climb up your legs and try and stab you. Wensley Shrive. We have Zoetrope Men and another one of the major NPCs that you can encounter. And then we start getting into the room descriptions themselves. It's all done on a spread format, which I really appreciate. So every room takes up exactly one page. Sometimes they take up two pages, like this one. Sometimes they take up exactly one column, but they're all very um, contained. They don't bleed from one page to another, and it makes it very easy to find the room that you're looking for. Each room has a kind of summary right there, so you get a, a brief overview of what's going on in the room, a description of the doors and what directions they're going in, if there are traps on the doors and things like that, and then an encounter table, and this encounter table is different for every room. So there isn't one overarching random encounter table, because depending on the zone that you're in, you might run into different types of characters. After the encounters, you get the descriptions of all the main things that are in that room. This can run anywhere from just a single paragraph all the way up to a whole bunch of text like we can see right here. Could some of these descriptions be tightened up a bit? Yes, I think they could in, in many of the rooms. However, it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, one of the things that people like about Patrick Stewart's work is the way that he writes and his prose, which can go on a bit longer than you might need for absolute you know, tightness and clarity. But in exchange, you're getting a lot of really great writing and a lot of elaboration on the different things that could happen there. And oftentimes he's giving you extra information on like, what if you say this to the NPC? What if you say this? So he often he gives you a lot of guidance that would be missing if things were as tight as possible. So it is a trade-off that you have to be aware of. 
there is something going on in virtually every room. This is not the sort of adventure that has a lot of empty rooms. Almost every room is its own little set piece. Sometimes they're very simple. Sometimes it's just like a small trap. Sometimes it's a whole thing that you can poke at and prod, things that you can take apart, things that you can reassemble, machines to mess with, all sorts of things uh, from room to room. Patrick does recommend that you read the entire book before running it. This is not the sort of book that can be run on the fly, and I definitely agree with him there. Room two basically has three whole pages of text. However, all of these words are not gonna be applicable as soon as you walk in the room. A lot of it is describing things that might happen in the future if you do a certain thing to this one particular thing. The headers for each section do a great job of helping you figure that out. For example, opening the mummy. If you don't open the mummy, you don't need to read basically any of this other stuff right here. If you wanna examine the ring of fire, then you would go down here and read this. There's a lot of things in the tomb that become relevant somewhere else. For example, there is uh, ash jars right here that are full of the ash of burned things. You can figure out what is burned inside of the jars by reading the label, which is in the language of fire. There's a part of the book later on where you can actually learn that language. And if you take the ashes in one of these jars and put it into a machine in a different room, you can reconstitute it back into what it was originally. There's all sorts of fun NPCs that you can run into, like the Ash Vizier, who's like this kind of duck who acts like a butler, and he's made of ash that is taken from your torch. So as you approach him, the ash from your torch streams out of it and forms into this creature who walks around right next to your torch talking to you. And he's very polite and he's extremely helpful until the moment comes when he could betray you, and then he does. Because he is secretly one of the tomb's guardians, and he is trying to keep you from leaving at all costs. Some of the rooms are just great little traps, like this pit trap. The only thing here is that you just have a triangular room as usual, and you have a triangular pit trap with spikes in the center there with this walkway around it. The difference is that the room is full of this very fine, fluffy ash so that you cannot see the pit. If you walk in, you'll just fall through the ash onto the spikes, and it creates a big floof of uh, ash into the air that causes you and everyone around you to start choking for the next minute. So what I really love about that is that it's a thing that kills you, but it's very easy to describe to the players what's going on. Uh, so it's very simple that way, but also very deadly. And it relies purely on, it's a, it's a physics problem. It's killing you with just the situation in front of you without using rules to kill you. So the players will have to think of it like a real situation and come up with a physical solution for it. You can't simply roll disable trap on a room full of ash. That doesn't make any sense. Some of the rooms feel like they would be a little bit more difficult to run, like this mirror maze where you walk in and it's all these hallways full of mirrors and there's secret doors right here where you can walk through and you have to try and find your way through it. That seems like it would be a little bit tedious to run just because you have to constantly be describing, you know, a room full of mirrors and they're just feeling around the walls to find all the secret doors. I don't know. It doesn't seem all that engaging. There are some slicing blades in the floors that can come up, but again, it does telegraph ahead of time that there is danger here because some of them have already sprung. Some of the traps are just, again, a physics-based trap. It's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine that we can see down over here. And it's a little bit too complicated for me. It's the sort of trap that I read the description and I had no idea how it worked. Once I saw this picture, I was able to piece it together a bit better. But again, that means that if I was running this for the players, I would probably have to show them this picture or I would not be able to describe it to them. That's a little bit over the top for me. I might try and simplify it somehow just so that it was a little bit easier to deliver using words. Generally, Patrick is really great at creating these physical traps, which is my favorite kind. So for this one, for example, it's a room that slowly fills up with hydrogen. So that means that the oxygen is leaving the room from the top down. So if you lie flat on the floor, you're going to be able to breathe until the whole room is filled with hydrogen, at which point the door will open. But there's other possible solutions, of course, like lighting all the hydrogen on fire, which will remove all the oxygen from the room and again, open the door. The ice demons are a particularly terrifying foe that will slowly reform and rebuild bodies of ice out of the moisture in the air once you open their doors. So they'll slowly reform and awaken some of their servants to come help them. And I love that they all have very concrete personalities. They also have great weaknesses that players can exploit, like they can only perceive negative thoughts and incapacities, they are bad liars, they are addicts, and they all hate each other. So they could be pretty easy to turn against one another once you figure that out. Every once in a while, you run into an NPC who actually has been there in prison for a very long time and could give you a lot more background about the tomb. Another reason to read that introduction at the beginning, I suppose. But it does have these short summaries of the things that he would say if you ask him basic questions about the tomb, which is a great thing to summarize. Another great trap slash situation right here. There's a bird headed man who's been frozen in this bubble of like slowed time. And as you touch it, you know, things slow down. So if you pick up like a brick and you throw it at this bubble, it'll just freeze in midair as it enters. And then if you eventually find a way to take down this 
time field, everything that's stuck in the field will start moving again in the exact same direction that it was before. So it could be a very deadly trap if a player like walks into the time field, for example, although again, it is telegraphed because there are things that are already stuck in it floating in midair. But it could also be used for all sorts of other purposes. Like if players wanted to keep an object safe, they could throw it into this field and it would essentially be safe there until someone else figured out how to disable the field. There's a super cool and powerful wizard staff here, which is causing the dungeon to be unscribable, and you can steal it and just give it to your wizard. But the trap here is that it's kind of floating in the middle of these four rings. You can see it over here, a bit like the rings in the teleporters in Stargate. And if you reach in between the rings and pull the staff out, the rings will suddenly collapse and crush your arm. So you have to try and get it out the right way. Every once in a while, you come across remnants of the giant sloth that used to live in the sloth tunnels nearby in which you can sometimes access. You can just find rooms that are full of dirt that he's dumped in there as he's cleared out his tunnels, giant dragon bones that he's gnawed on, lots of, I found that kind of charming, little notes to show that there was life here. I think this room is particularly smart. It is one of the starting rooms. So one of those holes on the surface goes straight down to this room, which is a cracked map, and it is a map of the whole dungeon. Not everything is filled in, only the central rooms in each of these different quadrants have a little symbol in there, giving you kind of an idea of what might be in that area, and it gives you a, a general layout, so you know that you're in a giant triangle-shaped dungeon. It gives you objectives that you can try and move towards. I'm a big fan of giving partial maps like this to players near the start of an adventure, just so they don't flail around and they don't feel completely aimless. They have a place that they can go to. There are some really beautiful rooms, like all of these rooms that are focused on art. So we have flame paintings, for example, which is, shows a flame you know, that's been painted in the shape of a particular object. And if the painting's broken, then the flame will actually leap out and consume the painting and will form that particular shape. So if, for example, if you let a whole, lit a whole city on fire using this combustion, the flame that's burning the city would look like the object that was portrayed in the painting. All sorts of crazy great ideas like that. You can find a meditation sphere here, which is like an object that seals you from the outside world completely, allowing you to focus it with extreme intensity and learn things much more quickly than usual. That would be really useful if you were a wizard and you were doing like spell scroll uh, research and things like that. There's all sorts of other fun objects that you can find as well, like these magic orbs, which when activated explode in a fireball, but a slow motion fireball that's just slow enough that you could run away from it. So it's one of those tools that's quite dangerous, but you'd have to deploy it in just the right way so that the enemy wouldn't have enough space or time to get away before it hit them. There's a projection room where there's a magical zoetrope, and if you stand in the middle of it and you spin it around, it can project your image anywhere within the dungeon. And you'll have a vague uh, sense or sight of your surroundings as you do this. And so you can use it to very slowly explore the dungeon from one particular room, although this room is difficult to get to. At the back of the book, we have some appendixes explaining some of the, in detail, some of the information that was referenced in the book, but wasn't fully fleshed out, like the actual um, convoy that one of the NPCs was leading, full of all sorts of weapons and useful supplies. You can't access it, though, until you get his monocle, because anyone without his monocle will never be able to find this as long as they are looking for it. There's a very useful table of treasure totals here in the back. So as you explore the dungeon, very often you'll pick up a lot of treasure and you'll forget to write down how much it's worth, or the game master just won't tell you. And later on, you want to sell it. This will actually help you remember what exactly it's worth. We have a couple of pages of item rules right here, which explain the rules for some of the more uh, interesting magic items that you can find here, including fire gum, which as you eat it will give you hallucinations. Classic Patrick Stewart, weird hallucinations. If you uh, eat too much of it, then things will go very badly for you and you'll just try and set yourself on fire. There's also the pages of notes that that one NPC has made explaining how to do this heist on the Frictionless Blue Glass Company. And this is also available in a handout right here that you can actually give to the players. I assume this is going to be useful in a subsequent adventure when you might actually do a heist. There's also an index at the back, which is very unusual for adventure and which I really appreciate and is written in Patrick Stewart's unique voice. So that's it for Demon Bone Sarcophagus. As usual, links are in the description where you can pick this up in print or PDF form. It is a meaty book. It took me a day or two to read the whole thing, and there was a lot of content in there. It's a book that is a bit of a mess due to the, all of the typographical errors and so on in the book, but also kind of a masterpiece. I think it is the best dungeon that Patrick Stewart has written, and it has a lot of extremely good dungeon rooms that would be a lot of fun to engage with. In any case, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.